Summer is the season that most of us look forward to all year. The sun, the beaches, the cookouts, with no more snow, no more shovels, and no more school. The days are longer, the nights seem softer, and the living, well, that's supposed to be easier, isn't it? But is any of this necessarily true anymore? Because for the last couple of days, let's face it, summer has been a drag. England has been in the grips of an unprecedented heat wave, with London, as well as parts of northern continental Europe, facing temperatures that have been 20 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. The thermometer hit 104 degrees in parts of England. Look at all the deep red circled on that map from the New York Times. Roads and rails and runways literally buckled in the UK, throwing transportation into chaos. And there's no sign the conservative government will start heeding the warnings it's already been getting to fortify infrastructure or to spend money on much needed action on climate change. People in Great Britain have been largely miserable this week. And this is the advice that the deputy prime minister actually gave them in advance of the brutal heat wave. Take a listen. We ought to enjoy the sunshine and actually we ought to be resilient enough through some of the pressures it will place. Wow. That was the government's message. In the face of an oncoming heat wave that has already killed 1,700 people in Spain and Portugal. Keep calm and enjoy the sunshine, y'all. And if that weren't enough, Europe already has winter to start worrying about. With Russia's Vladimir Putin playing a disturbing game of cat and mouse over the main pipeline that supplies natural gas from Russia to Germany. In a dispute over sanctions, Putin has cut exports through the pipeline by more than half and has threatened to stop them completely. The EU is warning member states to ration energy use by 15% immediately as it tries to store as much gas as possible before winter. One mayor in Germany telling the Washington Post that Putin is blackmailing Europe, adding that it's better to have a cold shower in summer than a cold apartment in winter. And in my home state of Texas, people are facing requests to ration energy for an entirely different reason. The company that operates the power grid is urging consumers to conserve electricity in order to limit rolling blackouts as power plants run nonstop. If that sounds familiar, that's because it, because it hasn't been that long since a devastating winter storm in 2021 that crippled and overwhelmed the power grid, killing more than 200 people in Texas. But has anything changed? Not really. The grid is still unconnected from the rest of the country, in part because Texas doesn't want, doesn't want to have to deal with the feds. President Biden announced some executive actions on climate Wednesday in Massachusetts. Now, we'll know more about how much they do and how much of an impact they'll actually have in the days ahead. But it's alarming how unprepared we seem to be to deal with the extreme weather events that come with climate change, not just in Texas, but around the globe. Those heat waves and cold snaps are all coming more frequently now, but we don't seem to be doing enough to prepare for them, let alone to stop them. Is the deputy prime minister's advice really the best we can do? Keep a stiff upper lip and suffer through it? Joining me now, Sheta Chakraborty, a behavioral scientist who studies how to communicate risks from climate and health threats. She's a president of U.S. operations for We Don't Have Time. Also with us, Michael Mann, author of The New Climate War and director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State. Thank you all for joining me. Shetta, uh, let me start with you. I want to begin uh, by talking about the extreme events that Americans and maybe Europeans, too, have gotten used to accepting. I just mentioned the deaths during last year's winter storm in Texas. We know that little has been done as a result of that. And more than a million Americans have died from COVID, yet the number keeps climbing by the hundreds every day. Can you help us understand why we seem to have gotten used to ignoring things that are existential threats, not just to our own lives, but really the future of humanity? That's a great question. We cannot get complacent to these risks. 
these risks are increasing in frequency and probability. If we get complacent now, we're not going to put in the work that's required to adapt to what we're already locked into and to stave off the worst case scenarios of climate change that are still very much potentially in our future. This is not the time to get complacent. Heat has killed thousands of Americans yearly, but it hasn't actually been reported because it's one of those risks that aren't really perceived as a risk. It's silent, it kind of creeps up on you. Similar to an infectious disease like COVID you mentioned, people are complacent until you see a disease outbreak. And similar to other impacts of climate change like sea level rise, it's invisible, it seems far away, it's so slow moving, but we know that these are risks that are in our, currently we are experiencing and are in our immediate future. So we can't afford to get complacent. We need to act urgently on them now, especially because the science makes it very clear what we can anticipate and there's still this time and this window to proactively prepare so we get ahead of these risks, so we don't continue to see the devastation that we're witnessing currently. Michael, experts say temperature records like the one broken by the UK heat wave used to be broken by fractions of degrees. But on Tuesday, uh, I believe this one was shattered by more than three degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, does this suggest climate change is accelerating faster than we feared? Yeah, thanks, Julian. It's, it's good to be with you. It's Sveta. Uh, good to be with you as well, my friend. Um, you know, what we are witnessing is that, if anything, some of these impacts are playing out sooner and with a greater magnitude than uh, we predicted, than our models suggested we would be seeing at this point. Now, when it comes to the overall warming of the planet, the, the models have done remarkably well. The models predicted that the planet would warm as much as it has, a little under one and a half degrees Celsius, a little under three degrees Fahrenheit, if we raised CO2 levels to the levels that we've now raised them. Um, so the warming of the planet is proceeding pretty much as expected, and that's bad enough. But some of the impacts of that warming, uh, the collapse of ice sheets and the contribution that they are now making to sea level rise, and these extreme weather events that are more prevalent than we would have expected at this point, some of these impacts are unfolding faster than we expected, and it has to do with uncertainty. Ironically, the critics love to cite uncertainty as a reason for inaction, but uncertainty is a reason for even more concerted action because of the very real possibility, and we're seeing that now play out, that the impacts might actually be worse than our models predicted. Shed a, a Gallup survey in March revealed that one out of three Americans has been personally affected by a weather event and that seems to have a profound impact on their views. 63% of those who've been affected by extreme weather worry a great deal about global warming, uh, compared to only 33% of those who have not been affected. Is this how it normally goes with Americans who need to empathize, not sympathize? It's easier to communicate real risks and get action to be taken once individuals have had some sort of interaction with that risk. So this is very much aligned to what we know in behavioral science in terms of this window to take advantage of. Post actual crisis, post impact of climate change, so after a big hurricane or wildfire or um, some sort of storm surge, this is when we have the tension of those who have experienced primary impacts of these, of these uh, weather events, but we also can plea to the rest of not just the US, but the world to, to feel the urgency of the need to act. This is the time, especially while we're in the midst of this heat wave in the US, in the UK, in Europe, around the world. This is when we can take advantage of the fact that we have individuals' attentions and we can ask policymakers to take actions that might not be politically expedient in the short term, but are really preserving security and human health for their constituents into the future. This is the time when we need to pass clean energy credits in the United States. We can't keep pushing back climate legislation because of excuses like inflation, when in fact, climate legislation will actually improve inflation for us long term, because we won't be dependent on dirty energy sources like coal and oil and gas. So let's actually find the opportunity in this window of those who are experiencing primary impacts of climate change like this devastating heat. And let's take the time to communicate and to implore policymakers to make consequential decisions now that will protect us in the future. 
Well, and speaking of, of uh, policymakers taking action, it looks like President Biden's climate announcement in Massachusetts uh, Tuesday calls for $2.3 billion in funding for FEMA's resilient infrastructure program, uh, broadening an HHS program that currently only offers heating in the wintertime to include cooling centers and energy efficient air conditioners in the summertime, and also directing the Interior Department to propose wind farms in the Gulf of Mexico. Surely these are all good things, but given the scope of the climate crisis, Michael, is it enough? Yeah, well, no, it's great to see, you know, Joe Biden pretty much doing everything he can as the chief executive in trying to address the climate crisis. But we've seen him blocked at every turn. The conservative courts have blocked uh, many of the key executive actions that the administration has tried to take. For example, um, the effort to prevent uh, new fossil fuel infrastructure on public lands uh, and, of course, Congress. Republicans in Congress and one uh, or two Democrats who have essentially caucused with them on these matters have blocked meaningful climate legislation. And look, there's only one way that we are going to meet our obligation to the world. The administration has committed to lower U.S. carbon emissions by 50 percent within this decade, which is what we need to do. And we need to set an example as the world's largest cumulative carbon emitter. If we don't lead, then we can't expect other nations to do so. And so here we have you know, a commitment that the United States has made, but there's no way we can meet that commitment without climate legislation, without com uh, codifying uh, the, the president's promise in the form of legislation. And right now that's blocked by congressional Republicans. There's a solution to this problem. If you care about the future of this planet, you have to turn out in this next election, in the midterm elections. We need to see larger majorities uh, among uh, Democrats who will support climate action so that we can actually advance climate legislation and a whole bunch of other things that we need to do that we currently can't because of this uh, opposition. Well, Michael, for people that want the nuts and bolts, uh, they want to get down to brass tacks on, you know, what can we do on a practical level to prepare for these extreme weather events? Uh, what can we do? Well, you know, look, we are seeing, you know, these catastrophic events now play out in real time. The loss of life from climate change impacts will soon exceed the loss of life uh, from COVID-19. In the long term, climate change threatens to be an even greater killer. And so we're seeing these devastating consequences. And there is no way that we will be able to insulate ourselves uh, from the devastating consequences of climate change simply through adaptation, simply as that one, uh, you know, that, that one uh, personality, that news personality said, uh, we just need to be resilient. This is the language of inaction. This is the language that has been used by fossil, the fossil fuel industry and their enablers to try to convince us that we don't need to do the hard work of decarbonizing our economy. That's what we need to do. There is no other path to protecting ourselves from devastating climate consequences. We need to get off the burning of fossil fuels and we need to do it quickly and we need politicians who will support those policies.